on the subject of endosulfans. And we're heading to southern India, to the state of Kerala, where the spraying of pesticides in great concentration has had tremendously traumatic effects on local communities there. Our next two speakers have got a, a long list of accomplishments in their careers. And um, because we are very short on time, I'm going to ask you to read that for yourself. They're both very experienced in journalism and in uh, film producing. And their latest documentary is called Toxic Valley. It's about that very subject. Will you please welcome Gitanjali and Simon Curian? Hello, everyone. Um, from the stars back to the ground, literally. Um, I often look at that picture and I think that it says everything about Simon and me. Um, we've been married for 26, 27 years, maybe. Um, it's a lifetime in marriage these days. Um, but we have a formula that helps us to survive. Um, he does all the serious things. He does most of the work. I do much of the talking. So in that vein, um, I'm going to be doing the presentation uh, today, and Simon will join us um, for the Q&A. Um, I'd also, um, firstly, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people and pay my respects to the custodians past and present of this beautiful land on which we are gathered this um, morning. Um, Simon and I are really um, honoured to have been given this opportunity to tell you a little bit about our film Toxic Valley. Um, to give you a sense of the film, um, we have, um, even though the film is um, currently now in post-production, uh, we have pulled out and put together a few clips um, so that you can have a sense of the film, um, meet a few of the people um, that tell the stories and um, get also um, a feel for the arguments that are at the centre um, of the discussion. Um, I would like to warn you, um, though, at the outset that um, some of these clips contain the voice and images of people um, who are now deceased. When we first set out to make um, this um, documentary, it was meant to be a short film um, about the endosulfan poisoning that happened in Kasargod, which is a border town in the southern Indian state of Kerala. Um, Simon first visited Kasargod in April of 2011 um, in the lead-up to the Stockholm Convention um, where the Conference of Parties was set um, to vote um, on a recommendation for a ban of the um, pesticide endosulfan. But once he got there, it was quite clear that this was not a story that could be told from Kasargod alone that what was happening in and to Castle Gold had resonance and repercussions um, for people across the world. And so um, it is thus that we are here um, where we are today, uh, making a feature-length documentary in three continents, um, three countries, um, India, Australia, and um, the US, um, looking at the impact of pesticides on people and the environment. We also had to make a conscious decision at that point. Um, as filmmakers, um, as uh, many of you will know, um, we make films in two ways. Um, we're either commissioned uh, by a broadcaster based either on a project that they want uh, to get done and think we are um, well set to do, or a proposal that we put through to them and they commission us to do it, or we make a film on our own. Now, um, in this case, we made a conscious decision to make this film um, on our own um, and self-funding it, um, because we felt that um, this was a story that needed um, to unfold as it was told, um, unfettered, as it were, by editorial or um, corporate constraints. Um, <clears throat> endosulfan. Endosulfan is an organochlorine compound um, that was used extensively worldwide, mostly as a pesticide for um, fruits and vegetables, for tea and grains. Um, some of the other organochlorine compounds that um, you may um, be familiar with and are banned substances now are DDT and um, aldrin. Endosulfan is considered a persistent organic pollutant um, because of its uh, persistence and its capacity to bioaccumulate in the environment and to travel 
um, large distances, long distances far away from um, the uh, place where it was originally used. Um, Kasergod was at the center of the global debate on whether or not endosulfan should be banned. Um, could we play clip one? ಬುರ್ತಡೆಕ್ಕೆ <laughs> This morning, um, in introducing um, Bull Talks, um, Anton told us about how Dai had said to him that um, she wants to have a control of her own destiny, and it's something that all of us uh, would like to believe we have. This young woman, Shilavati, did not have that luxury. And um, she was, as she has explained, on her way back from school as a young girl when the helicopters flying over um, were spraying the endosulfan. It sprayed down on her, and that was the rest of her life. In 1976 in Kasargod, the government-owned uh, Plantation Corporation of Kerala started the aerial spraying of thousands of hectares of cashew plantations. The plantations hugged the hillsides and going down into the valley, which then leads to the sea. There were 11 villages that were placed scattered within those plantations and around it. These helicopters flew over wide swathes of land, raining the pesticide indiscriminately on water bodies, on the villages, on the homes, on the people that lived there as they crisscrossed from plantation to plantation. Soon in those 11 villages, people began noticing that children in nearly every other household were being born with birth defects both mental and physical um, deficits. Among adults, the incidence of infertility, um, neurological disorders, and respiratory issues rocketed to improbable highs. And as the years passed, over a 1,000 deaths have been at attributed directly to the endosulfan poisoning, and over 4,000 people in these villages have been left with chronic diseases also attributed to the known effects of endosulfan. These are not large popul this is not a large population that you could explain it away by seeing that anywhere you go you're going to find that many people ill with this kind of diseases. Small place, small group of people. 4,000 is a large number for them. Clip two, please. Uh, so far, uh, no scientific bodies uh, given a concrete uh, report uh, that uh, all this happened due to the endosulfan and all that. So far, no report has come out. This is almost like not accepting some research which is not according to your wishes. Now, 
there is not one study, there is not two study, there are multiple tens of studies that has happened in Kasargod by government agencies, by NGOs, uh, by even industry groups, uh, which have found that endosulfan was the only contaminant in the entire Kasargod area, which could have led to this kind of horrific health impact that we see in Padre village and, and the surrounding Thank areas. CSE was the first study, Center for Science and Environment did its first study in 2000 and we linked high amount, again we found high amount of endosulfan in all biological sample as well as water and food commodities. The entire thing is a hoax, the king is naked, that is what I am saying. Nobody looked into this in a scientific manner and said that there is no endosulfan, nobody did. So here there is no voice for the scientist, there is no endosulfan case. There is no ill effect in Kasar goat. All these chemicals are known hormone disruptors. There is no reason when we, when we find that there are reproductive health defects occurring in this area and there is a high pesticide use known in this area and the literature says that these pesticides are endocrine disruptors. There is, it is unscientific for anyone to expect that this could not be the cause of uh, reproductive health defects. The argument of whether or not endosulfan was um, responsible um, for what happened uh, in Kasargod has not surprisingly played out um, in the public arena. Um, and the public debate has been um, quite robust. And as you can see from that clip, scientists, medical doctors, they have quite divergent views on whether or not endosulfan was responsible. And while the state and central governments and the Plantation Corporation of Kerala um, and the manufacturing industry, not surprisingly as well, lobbied hard to sort of deny any connection, it was soon very clear that there was only one common denominator for the tragedy of um, Kasargod. And that common denominator was the endosulfan spraying by Plantation Corporation of Kerala. Um, clip three, please. Mm. Mm. Teacher, you are not a good teacher. 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 You I can uh, see the if it is happened, if it is happened um, due to the usage of uh, endosulfan by PCK. Sorry, that's all. <laughs> How can I say any more, anything more? No, if it is happened, only the answer is that. If it is happened, sorry, that's all I can say the managing director of Plantation Corporation. That was his response to the question, what will you say to the people of, uh, of uh, Kasargod? While Kasargod rejoiced in the aftermath of the Stockholm Convention that voted, on, um, voted to ban endosulfan worldwide, elsewhere in India, um, farmers were horrified. For every issue like this, there's two sides. And in making this film, we've had to look at both sides. Industry bodies and manufacturers were uh, quick to put this horror to good use because what they did 
then was to file a case in the Indian Supreme Court um, seeking an order against the ban on endosulfan. However, in December 2011, sense um, was restored when the Indian Supreme Court um, upheld the ban. In countries like India, Agrochemical dependency, particularly for subsistence farmers and smallholders, is the difference between um, success and failure. Or at least that's how um, they see it or have been um, told to see it. Andhra Pradesh is another state also in southern India, and it is, um, I think, about 60% of the people there are engaged in agriculture, and it is also, or it was also, uh, the highest user of endosulfan in India. And not surprisingly, um, it was here that the protest against um, the ban on endosulfan was at its loudest. Why ban something that costs us $5 a litre? and force us to buy an alternative that will cost us 10 times the same? That was their question. And uh, from a smallholder or an indigenous farmer, it is a logical question for them to ask, and they were at a loss to understand um, this ban at all. Um, clip four, please. We have about 50,000 acres of uh, vegetable plantation. All of 99% uh, are smallholders. Every vegetable or any product produced by these farmers is consumed by them, by their neighbors, in every, everybody in the village. How is it there was no effect? Tell me. There are almost uh, half a million villages in India where every day they use this um, endosulfon and uh, there there is no side effects. Just because one community of farmers says, you know, we have no problem, we do not know whether that's true. We know Kasargod is true. We know that there's something happened in Kasargod. And there's very compelling evidence that endosulfan has caused this. If it is not endosulfan, what is? Nobody is able to give an answer. It's easy to say, look for something else. What do you look for? And we know that endosulfan does these problems, does cause these problems. When we know that somebody slaps you in the face and your cheek stings, you don't go looking for something else other than the slap. <laughs> if anyone here thinks um, that pesticide pollution is a third world or developing world problem, then you would be highly mistaken. Take Australia, for instance. There is not a single pristine water body left in Australia. One of the key reasons for pollution of our water bodies is um, agrochemicals that leach uh, into the water through the soil from our agricultural lands. This is true of the Tweed River. This is true of the Richmond River. This is true of our seas. This is true of our great natural wonder, the Great Barrier Reef. 
Um, we have over 8,000 pesticides and veterinary chemicals in use in Australia, and among them, over 80 are banned in countries like um, UK, France, Germany, and the EU. Um, some of the most toxic among them are atrazine, uh, which we use um, as a um, herbicide for um, sorghum, um, maize, um, pine plantations. Um, and then we have diuron, uh, which is an algicide, um, which has posed a huge risk um, to the seagrass, uh, the corals, and the dugongs in the Great Barrier Reef. And, um, and then there is uh, chlorpyrifos, which is known to be toxic to um, human beings and birds and um, pollutes our um, water bodies. Um, clip five, please. This area up here on North Creek of the Richmond River is, is an area of oyster leases which are now largely derelict. All of these mangrove edges along here, you can see the pneumatophores of the mangrove coming out. They ought to be encrusted with oysters. And you can see there's barely an oyster attached to them because the larval oysters are dying. And they're dying because of toxins in the water. And many of these toxins are pesticides that we're applying to our agricultural landscapes. They're things like herbicides. We know that oysters in this river die of a parasitic disease. That disease is preceded by the immune system of the oyster becoming suppressed. And that suppression is likely to be driven by exposures to herbicides like diuron running off the landscape. Products which are supposedly safe in Australia and yet they're banned in Europe because of their toxicity to aquatic animals like oysters. The fishery here is in precipitous decline. There are now only around about six fishermen left fishing in the Richmond River. Back in the 60s, this fishery supported some 130 fishermen and their families, entirely living off the catch of mullet, blackfish, caught in areas like this. There were some fantastic commercial fishery shots along here. Now there's no point even setting the nets because the fish are not there. Just coming up to an area here, one of the major drains that comes out of the, uh, the cane land. So this is a point of, of significant discharge. But now you can see these deep drains that have been cut. The water gushes off the floodplain, comes gushing off the agriculture and shoots straight into the river. And the fish really don't have an opportunity to get away because these drains are jutting in at various points along the river. So even when the fish get the signal from fresh water coming down, they start moving away from the dirty water, but then they get trapped behind drains. So in 2008 and 2001 on this river, all of the fish in this section died of a low oxygen event due to the quality of the water coming off the floodplain. Over six billion pounds of pesticides are used every year worldwide, and nearly 80% of that uh, is used in the agricultural sector. With thousands of varieties of pesticides in use worldwide, even the most precautionary regulatory regimes would find it quite difficult to keep track of the impact that these pesticides are having on us and our environment. Only 0.1% of the pesticides that are applied to our farmlands actually reach their intended targets, the pests. The remaining 99.9% .9 is left to disperse um, or persist in the environment through air, water, soil, and of course, through our food chain. Pesticide residues have poisoned pristine environments far away from where they have been used the Arctic, the Antarctic, the Himalayas, the Great Barrier Reef. In so many of the environmental and health issues that have exercised us in recent times, where commercial in interests have had a hand, um, be it lead poisoning or um, asbestos or climate change or uh, tobacco, um, the knowing and willful intent of manufacturers and corporates, and uh, to a great extent our governments, unfortunately, and, um, and regulatory bodies, has been to discredit the victims, to dismiss 
informed questioning um, or protest as activism with all the negative connotations that such a term brings, while they hide behind that old chestnut. Lack of conclusive proof. Talk about doublespeak. There's doublespeak for you. Lack of conclusive proof. Often the um, toxicity of these um, chemicals is hard to prove um, in the short term. After a long-term chronic exposure, we only come to know of the toxicity and the extent to which it can damage our environment and um, destroy our health when chronic exposure has manifested itself in tragic consequences at, as it did um, in um, Kasergod. Even then, the burden of proof is on the victim. Because when it comes to manufacturers, and this is something that um, one of the people that we spoke with in the course of this film said. He said, when it comes to our manufacturers, our regulators take a liberal view of the standards of proof that they have to provide before they market this product. But when it comes to ordinary people, the people on whom these products are inflicted, our regulators expect us, when we say that this is dangerous, they expect us to have the most stringent measures of proof to prove risk or danger. Take organochlorins, for instance, um, like um, you know, um, endosulfan and DDT. Um, one of the reasons for their popularity is the fact that they were persistent, which means that one application can you know, have an effect over a long term. That very advantage, it soon turned out, was its greatest disadvantage. But by the time we and our governments and our regulators and our scientists came to this conclusion, the damage had already been done. Typically in making this film, we found that the central issue that is debated by communities, governments, scientists, manufacturers and experts is one where the knowledge that agrochemical dependency will bring with it assuredly um, tragic consequences and human suffering is weighed against economic expediency. On the one hand are those who believe that farmers, regulators and manufacturers are managing the risk presented by these chemicals within acceptable parameters. On the other hand are people who believe that we must stop using pesticides now. And they ask the question, what is acceptable risk? How much of a risk is a risk worth taking? One of the tragic consequences of pesticide use is that it reaches unintended um, and unsuspecting vict victims, as I said earlier, through air, water, food, soil. In countries like India, there is another great challenge. Large populations live in close proximity um, to farmland. And, and therefore, they have direct exposure, as it happened in Kasargod and as it happens in places like Punjab. Punjab is a northern Indian state that was at the center of the, in, um, the Green Revolution of the 1960s, when high-yielding uh, varieties of seeds, um, new methods of irrigation, and strong fertilizers were introduced here. Pesticides were used in great quantities to combat pests, and in the immediate aftermath, production rose. Soon Punjab became the breadbasket of India, in the immediate aftermath, yields increased, crop rotation meant that productivity improved, the revolution spread around the country, and soon India was a food surplus state. And then the tide turned. Yields began to drop as the soil degraded. Costs rose as pests became resistant to the pesticides and they ended up needing to use larger and larger quantities of pesticides. Soon common birds and insects, friendly insects, disappeared. Then one day, it became clear that Punjab was not just the breadbasket of India, it was also the cancer capital. Clip six, please. He, he was uh, doing cotton farming and wheat farming. And he was spraying? Spray the car. 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 Spray
ਹਰਾ ਦਾ ਨਜ਼ਰ ਹੈ ਜ਼ਾਹਿਰ ਕੀ ਬਣ ਜਾਏ ਜੋ ਨੂੰ ਬਾਰ ਬਾਰ ਨਾ ਲੱਗਦੇ ਹਾਂ ਜੇ ਤੋ ਜ਼ਾਹਿਰ ਹੀ ਕਲਰੀ ਪੇ ਗਿਆ he was well built 6 uh, months before this <laughs> and uh, within 6 months his condition after appearance of a node in his uh, neck and then post that uh, his de- uh, condition has deteriorated very quickly and uh, on uh, pathological diagnosis this is squamous cell carcinoma which is a highly aggressive form of cancer you know before they could just drink water from anywhere now we are afraid we don't know then there is poison everywhere we did this study actually uh, from the request of the local community uh, who were really worried about the riding rising case of of cancer in the cotton belt of punjab which is actually bhatinda and roper after our initial research uh, we found that uh, these areas have very high use of pesticide then we decided to look at uh, the pesticide level uh, in, in the blood of the farmers and we found a cocktail of pesticides in the blood in the blood samples uh pesticides like ddt monocrotophos which is very very toxic uh we also find malathion uh and and uh, chlorpyrifos and when we compared uh, the result of uh, punjab study of ours with the cdc results in the us uh, to our surprise we found that the amount of pesticides in the farm in the blood of the farmers in punjab were as much as 1000 times higher than what cdc had found in the population of the us the national cancer center in bikaner in um, punjab reports a seven times growth in the number of patients that they have been seeing just in the last um, decade alone um Punjab is one of the largest users of pesticide um in India. It uses 6972 million tons a year. 54% of the pesticides used in India um if you can uh, imagine this is used on cotton crops, but cotton is only grown on 5% of the agricultural crops. And Bhatinda in uh Punjab is a place that is um almost completely immersed in um cotton farming not surprisingly each night at 9:50 in the evening there is a train that leaves train number 54703 leaves the batinda railway station packed to the rafters with cancer patients on their way to the regional cancer center in bikaner clip 7 please <laughs> ਕੀ ਆਪਣਾ ਸਿਆਗੀ ਆ 
फिर कुमार साहब डॉक्टर है बीकानेर उसने ऑपरेशन करवाया है तो इलाज चल रहा है अब क्या कर, क्या करता है आप हाँ चेकअप करें खेती में क्या कर रहा है खेती में आप खेती में क्या कर रहा था खेती में सफरे सफरे करते हैं ट्रैक्टर से और क्या the use and management of pesticides is really a contemporary riddle on the one hand, we have the dependency that has been built over the last um, century and growing concerns for food security and hunger. On the other hand, we have the now known and patent impact of pesticides on people and the environment as we see clusters of disease, cancer, neurological disease, um, um, fertility issues growing especially within our farming communities. For us, in the end, for Simon and me, this film was about the people. It was about a community that bore the brunt of a pesticide poisoning that they had no um, choice in, and they still pay the price. It was about another community where farmers are bewildered by the withdrawal of this um, endosulfan because it had got them through the years it was about a small town in Australia whose people are worried and watch with sadness as their river dies. It was about people, it was about people like Shifana, whom you saw earlier. It was about Umaybat Sharia, a four-year-old girl whose mother now wonders, why was my little girl born to me, a woman who had been exposed through no choice of mine to endosulfan? Clip eight. Okay, I'll leave it there.
pretty sobering moment there. It's one thing to understand this on an intellectual basis, but as you say, it is about the people. And, you know, that unforgettable shot of Shafana's mother and the pain on her face. We just saw the, the other mother there, Umabat's mother. Um, were those people keen and willing to speak to you? Very much so. Very much so. They want their stories to be told, so... Um, I'll leave. Is the mic on? Is it... Turn it on? Yes. It is on, yeah. yeah. Uh, the question I... I'm sorry, I didn't... Can you... Was it, was it difficult to get those people to reveal those very painful things? Initially, yes, it was. And, uh, but uh, then once they found out that, uh, you know, what we were doing, and over several trips and several meetings, they have sort of opened up to us. And uh, it was a very slow process to get to them and speak about such painful, painful things, yeah. Um, in the